Good afternoon. My name is Lisa Polish. I'm the director of the Clean Energy Resource Teams, or CERTS. Thank you so much for joining us for our first Energy Futures session of 2021. We are excited to be partnering with the Institute on the Environment on what will actually be a pair of energy storage focused sessions. Today, we're gonna to be focusing on really the big picture of energy storage and what that expansive term can include and what it means for what the future of energy storage may look like, particularly here in Minnesota. Uh, for folks to know, in our April session, we'll be focusing more on sort of brass tacks near-term opportunities. And for those of you who just can't get enough of storage, we'll be um, hosting a more in-depth workshop together in June. On that note, this is a short 45-minute session. We do encourage you, though, as you have questions, just feel free to pop them right into that Q&A at the bottom of your screen. We're hoping to get to a few of those questions yet today, and the questions will actually inform all of our future programming. For a little bit of background, these Energy Future sessions are really designed to invite people to sort of take a moment to pause and imagine what some different energy futures may look like. And with all of these, we really hope to bring in different viewpoints and different perspectives so people can get a more expansive set of ideas, hopes, um, thoughts about where that future may go. We have a wonderful trio of speakers here today that will help us with that imagining and thinking about the future. And without much further ado, I'm excited to welcome Akisha Everett, my co-moderator for today. Akisha is the Energy Storage Project Manager at the Institute on the Environment. Akisha has been coordinating and shepherding this kind of intense set of pilot projects around energy storage. And at our next session, we're gonna really dig into those. But until then, Akisha, I will turn it over to you. Thanks. Thank you, Liz. Um, hello, I'm Akisha and welcome. Um, I'm very excited to be here. Um, like Liz just said, we, I'm from the Institute on the Environment. I work in energy storage, so I'm, I'm very excited to have these three speakers. And without further ado, let me tell you something about them. Ellen, what has she not done, right? Um, she is currently the climate director, climate program director at the Minnesota Center, Center for Environmental Advocacy. She has clerked for the Minnesota Court of Appeals. She was a Hennepin County Public Defender. She served as the chair of Minnesota Public Utilities Commission, was on the energy, in, energy environmental advisor for Governor Dayton, um, serves, at, serves, in, serves in, she served in as a Minnesota Senator from 1993 to 2011. And she started and led the Energy Transition Lab at the University of Minnesota. <sighs> Ellen, oh my goodness, what a bio. Um, Mark, Mark, we have Dr. Mark Perez, senior researcher at the Clean Power Research in California. He's trained scientists with 15 years of, spirit of experience in solar PV sector across multiple roles, commercial and industrial. Uh, energy development, academia, corporate research, and software development. He currently serves on the board of American Solar Energy Society, the International Battery Energy Storage Alliance, and Joint Forces for Solar. Todd, Todd Olinsky Paul, is a senior director for Clean Energy Group and Clean Energy State Alliance. Todd Olinsky directs the Energy Storage and Technology Advancement Partner Partnership, uh, a federal state funded and information sharing project that aims to accelerate the deployment of electrical energy storage technologies in the United States. Mr. Olinsky Paul also works to advance distributed energy storage for resilience and cost savings through, safe, uh, through state policy and program development economic analysis and regulatory reform. So there you have it, our three all-stars. Um, so let's dig in. Um, Ellen, we can start with you. Five years or so ago, many, many moons ago, um, you really began to dig into storage. Uh, this was actually your role um, as executive director in the Energy Transition Lab. Um, as you think about energy transition, tell us why storage is so important. 
Great, thanks, Akisha. And I'm um, really happy to be here with all of you today. So as, as you said, Akisha, in 2015, at the Energy Transition Lab, we were um, working on advancing the transition to a clean energy future and to a decarbonized grid. And looking around the country, we saw that energy storage was a key linchpin technology that was going to enable that transition and that it was developing quickly around the United States, but not so much in Minnesota. People were not really talking about it in Minnesota. So we organized uh, the first energy storage summit. We brought key stakeholders to the table, utilities, U of M technical experts, clean energy companies, advocacy groups, government, et cetera. And we, had, we brought in the leader from California's energy storage um, efforts. And it was really eye-opening for all of us. Then we founded the Minnesota Energy Storage Alliance. We spun off many projects and educational events. And we also um, created the community scale energy storage demonstration projects and guidebook project, which I think you'll be hearing more about at the next session. So looking back, um, I remember about 20 years ago when I was pushing really hard for renewable energy policy at the state legislature. Mm -hmm. And I remember saying that energy storage is the holy grail that we need to build out renewable energy. When the wind isn't blowing or the sun isn't shining, we could still provide dispatchable power 24 seven with battery st with storage. But since that time, we've learned so much more about storage and what it can do. Um, so yes, we do need long duration storage to maximize the value of renewable energy. That's still true. But I wanna highlight uh, just four or five other quickly services that energy storage can provide. So first of all, as we modernize and decarbonize the electricity grid, energy storage is critical. The, you know, the legacy grid based on fossil fuel plants is not good at ramping up and down quickly as demand for electricity fluctuates. And, and these plants as a result tend to be overbuilt, inefficient, polluting, and expensive to run. And um, as we're tra transitioning to clean renewable resources spread across a, a large geography, large scale energy storage will play a key role. It's very fast responding. It can almost instantaneously level out fluctuations in supply and demand, as well as improve power quality, which is essential for our economic activities. And it can regulate frequency, provide uninterruptible power for critical infrastructure like safety and health and water resources. So that's one key function. Um, energy storage can also replace fossil fuel plants and it can be used to cut carbon emissions dramatically. One example is replacing those polluting combustion turbine plants, which are used across the country to meet peak demand on mm -hmm. the hottest days of the year. For example, some utilities now are replacing those peaker plants with a combination of solar and batteries. And they can help store excess power and dispatch it immediately when it's needed at peak hours of the day, when it's the hottest day of the year, for example. Um, a third function is that energy storage can help solve transmission constraints. And if we don't have a, a backbone of, of a strong transmission network across the country, we will not be able to build out and support a clean, efficient, reliable grid with a lot of renewable energy in it. So for example, if you have a wind or solar farm in a remote rural area, with, um, with batteries, you can store the excess power and then you can inject it into the grid when it's needed so it doesn't overload the transmission system. Or you can replace aging distribution infrastructure systems with non-wires alternative like solar and batteries. And keep in mind that building new transmission lines takes a very long time, many years, and often faces local opposition. So battery storage systems, alternatively, can be deployed very quickly and with, with less controversy. I'll give you one more, one more function of storage that's super important. And I know you're going to hear a lot more from Todd about this. Um, you really need energy storage to provide resiliency. And we know climate change is accelerating extreme weather events. We just saw this recently in Texas. And in those situations, you need emergency backup and disaster response um, 
There's a local organization I'm going to plug called the Footprint Project. Look them up. They deploy solar battery trailers after disasters, and they are using that to, to go where people have been, you know, their homes have been destroyed, their cities are, are crumbling because of disasters or whatever the situation is. And these trailers can go anywhere across North America and provide lighting, communication, so you can charge your cell phone and communicate with people, refrigeration, so you can take care of your insulin needs and other um, cold things that require cold. And they even powered a COVID-19 field hospital on the Mexican border. So this kind of resiliency uh, infrastructure is especially important for the most vulnerable poor and communities of color who are already experiencing the worst impacts of pollution and climate change. So I could go on and on, but I think I'll stop <laughs> now. And um, no, Ellen, that was so great. Next. And I, I mean, I think you're already starting to tee up some of the questions that are coming in. Not surprisingly, people are asking some questions about what just happened in Texas. And I think you're addressing that. Mm -hmm. One other thing that I would love to have you address um, is this like, are we talking about just batteries, right? And, and I know that in a lot of the different work that you were doing, when you first started this initiative, I think I had this moment and I, and I think it was that first conference that you hosted in 2016 where people were saying, but what about, you know, storing water in our water heaters? And maybe you could say a little bit more about, uh, you know, storage is not just batteries. Can you say a tiny bit more about that for us? Tiny bit more. Well, I made a list and it's, I'll just go through it really fast because it's, it's kind of a long list of all the things that are not necessarily just lithium ion batteries, because mostly it's lithium ion batteries is what we hear about when we talk about storage. So first of all, those can be used, I mean, obviously those are used in electric vehicles. And I know in the Northeast, they're using, you know, electric school buses to um, not only take kids to school, but then provide backup power for the school. And um, some of these uh, car manufacturing companies are using second life batteries after they've they powered an electric vehicle for a period of time. There's still a lot of capacity left. And so they're trying to create circular supply chains. Um, besides lithium ion batteries, there's also flow batteries, which are um, have a lot of different capabilities than lithium ion. They can last a lot longer. They can have long duration storage, at least eight to 12 hours and sometimes more. And there's a new, uh, there's lots of startup companies around this. and Form Energy partnered with our local utility, Great River Energy, to um, set up a 100% um, renewable energy future for their utility using an aqueous air system, which is a type of flow battery. So here's a really quick list of some things that are energy storage that are not batteries. There's flywheels. There's hot water heaters that you mentioned, Lissa. You can, um, there's programs controlled by the utilities where you know, they can uh, heat up the water at night when wind energy is abundant and very low cost, and then the water is available during the daytime. Um, a lot of people see the MISO grid, which is our regional uh, transmission operator grid, which covers 15 states in the United States. And we, that, that, that basically acts as a battery because it provides resources that are available spread out that widely 24-7 across 15 states. This is what Texas does not have, and it makes us more resilient. There's mechanical systems like um, pumped hydro where, you know, the water goes up the hill and then it's released downward to get the power out of it. You can also do that with, there's experiments about using old mine pits in Northern Minnesota for pumped hydro. There's research about a, putting a giant ladder <laughs> like a big balloon in the Great Lakes to store power and then release it when needed. Um, underground caverns use compressed air storage. And then um, the last thing I'll mention is sort of some of the chemistry ideas. There's some uh, work on ammonia and hydrogen as another kind of um, vehicle or holder of, of energy. And at the University of Minnesota Morris, they figured out how to make renewable hydrogen and ammonia from basically magic. They use energy from the wind turbines, water, and air. And they can use it to make ammonia and hydrogen that can be a longer term and lower cost storage material. So that's my short list. There's probably a lot more. 
and they're lower cost. Thank, so you, Ellen about the, cost thank you, Ellen, for the short list. I'm glad we didn't get the long list, right? <laughs> so Mark, um, if you wouldn't mind gracing us with your expertise, um, Ellen has already teed up um, the conversation about MISO. And if you don't know what MISO is, it's the Midwest Independent Systems Operator. Um, we want you to talk about the analysis that you conducted with MISO, um, the solar potential analysis, and what you found out about how renewables and storage connect. It's a great question. Um... Akisha, and thank you for inviting me onto this uh, very exciting panel. I think it's really important to talk about these issues. The work we did with uh, MISO was investigating specifically how to get to 100% renewables within the region without breaking the bank. Okay. Now, you know, renewables are a different animal than our traditional energy generation paradigm because they can't be fired up on demand. They're at the mercy of the elements when the wind blows and when the sun shines. And therefore, we need to bridge the gap between when the sun's shining and when the wind's blowing and when demand is being required of it. And in order to do that, you need some sort of balancing um, tool. And that tool is energy storage. And as Ellen mentioned, there's many different types of energy storage out there. I'm agnostic technologically. I just don't want it to cost too much money, both in economic terms and environmental terms. Um, and right now, the cheapest energy storage technology out there and the vast majority of energy storage on the planet is pumped hydro. Um, there's a ton. You need mountainous regions because you need a big height difference in order to pump water up and store energy. It's kind of like a grandfather clock, you know, raising the weights. Um, so we found in MISO region that using a combination of solar, wind and energy storage, we could get costs down below the current wholesale rates for power supply within the region. Um, which is really phenomenal given, um, you know, how much energy storage you think you otherwise would need to bridge things, bridge imbalances like uh, the seasonality of the resource. There's a lot more sun in the summer than in the winter and right. vice versa for wind. How do you overcome those balancing things without adding an enormous amount of storage? And I think that'll bring, bring us to the next point that I want to make on this implicit storage concept. Yeah. I think you have a question related to this feature. Yeah. So Mark, it's, I think the first time I heard that term, I was like, say what? Um, I, I mean, I think implicit storage, I mean, I sort of, based on the two words, I kind of get it, but can you walk us through what you mean by that and why you think about it as storage? Sure. So storage is there. Um, the job for storage is to balance between supply and demand. When you have supply and when you, uh, it's to bridge the gap between supply and demand, essentially. And implicit storage does the same effect. It's a balancing tool. And essentially, you're overbuilding the renewable capacity by some margin. Um, in the case of MISO territory, we found that the optimal to be about 1.5x, so 50% on the capacity of the wind farms and solar. So that means for a one kilowatt solar system that you need on an energy basis to hit 100%, you're building 1.5 kilowatts in order to have uh, margin on the capacity. And that allows you to ramp up um, the capacity to meet demand when supply would otherwise have been in, in, uh, insufficient. So that's why we're calling it implicit storage because it's a balancing effect. Imagine a day when we don't have enough sunlight and we've only sized the solar to meet demand um, on an energy basis. We don't have enough solar power on this day, but if we overbuild capacity by 50%, suddenly we have 50% more supply on that day when we otherwise would have had a shortfall. So it's mm -hmm. a balancing effect. You use the margin on capacity to reduce the amount of energy storage you otherwise would have needed, which can be tremendously costly. Um, and what we found in MISO is that if you don't use this implicit storage technique to meet 100% renewables, you need 10 times more energy storage. And that's incredibly costly, both in economic terms and environmental terms. If you're talking about batteries, you know, you got to mine a ton of lithium or some other uh, electrochemical, you know, chemical component. And that comes with all sorts of environmental implications. Right. Pump tighter, you need to flood a bunch of valleys and you need, you know, big mountain, big mountain ranges in order to even build that in the first place. Um, so it's, it's um, environmentally, you're, you're adding 50% to the renewables, which has its own environmental um, impacts, you know, associated with it. Um, 
but it's way less environmental impact and economic impact than building 10 times as much uh, electrochemical storage, most likely. So one of the things I remember reading in the report related to this is this, <laughs> this, this word curtailment. And I, and I know that there's a lot of conversation about, you know, is this part of the system designed to have it? Mm -hmm. Or is it like a glitch in the system? And, and I would love to have you sort of speak to that. And, you know, Ellen was bringing up hydrogen and ammonia. And I'm wondering, were those sort of, as you think about curtailment, curtailment, were hydrogen and ammonia part of what you modeled? Like, how, how, what storage were you looking at? How do those pieces fit together? That's a great, good, bunch of great questions and, and content there, Lisa. Um, so yeah, when you overbuild the system, you're going to curtail. If we overbuild the system by 50%, which was the optimal overbuilding amount that we found for MISO, you're gonna curtail um, a third of the energy because we've overbuilt by 50%. So one third of the energy is, is curtailed. And you consider that um, as waste. You know, Most people would consider, oh, we're wasting the energy. But consider the alternative is to build 10 times as much energy storage. And that is incredibly wasteful, both in economic and in environmental terms. You're talking about 10 times more lithium, 10 times more environmental impacts associated with the batteries, 10 times more flooded area you know, for the, for the pumped hydro, et cetera. What was your second question again, Lisa? So I'm, I'm wondering about um, hydrogen. how hydrogen and ammonia fit. Because there are folks that are working in that space right. that are like, we won't waste it. We're going to use it for something else. So was that part of what yeah. you were looking at? I mean, any, we used, we modeled battery storage, lithium ion battery storage, because that according to NREL's uh, annual technology baseline forecast is going to be even cheaper than pumped hydro by 2050. So, and it's very modular, so you can easily build it anyway. You don't need mountains or anything. Um, hydrogen could also work, you know, why not? Um, and furthermore, you don't necessarily need to create ammonia uh, with, with hydrogen, you, you electrolyze water, you stick, you know, two, a current through water and you create hydrogen and oxygen. The hydrogen you can combine with captured carbon dioxide and then create all sorts of synthetic fuels. It's what the Nazis did in World War II because they didn't have access to oil. You know, you can create any fuel from, you know, hydrogen captured from water essentially. I think that has great promise. The question comes down to cost for me. And given where lithium ion batteries are projected to be by in the future, um, you know, I, I see it hard for hydrogen uh, paradigm to compete, but you know, I'm totally technology agnostic. Why not? Uh, if we, if, if the cost of electrolyzers and fuel cells or this uh, um, carbonization, you know, syn synthetic fuel thing can get down to a level where it can compete with lithium ion batteries, go for it. I, I just don't want it to be more expensive than it otherwise would need to be to get to the end goal, which in my opinion, should be 100% renewables. So all that, Mark, uh, is pretty, pretty big picture. Mm -hmm. And it's starting to tee up all kinds of things when we think about transition. Um, but if, we're, if we start to think about storage, um, let's start to think about it in on a community scale and how that connects with the system, right? So Todd, Ellen started to talk about the different kinds of storage meeting, uh, different kinds of storages and the ways that they meet the needs. Can you tell us about the incentives needed for storage to be available? What, what do you think? First of all, tell me what you mean about the notion of value stacking with storage. I'm, I'm completely, that hasn't come across Cross me and um, what what this means for deployment. Sure. Well, first of all, thanks a lot for having me here. Um, and I just want to back up about two steps from your question and say, uh, first of all, um, with regard to to uh, the discussion just prior, um, it's you know costs only account for one side of the equation, and so just talking about cost comparison doesn't tell us much about value. So you have to have cost and benefits. Those, that's the, the other side of that equation, right? So you could compare the cost 
of storage to the cost of solar, for example. But the reality is that they're not serving the same, they're not providing the same service, right? Okay. Uh, solar does something, storage does something. Right. And sometimes storage does five or 10 things. So, so we have to look at not just the cost per installate for kilowatt hour of installation or whatever, however you want to look at cost, we have to also look at what are the benefits and what is the cost benefit ratio and, and how, what does that tell you about value? And that's really what you, you need to look at. Um, so that brings us to what your question about stacking because um, yes, storage has decreased in, in cost quite a bit, just as solar did. And we're seeing uh, the cost curves for, for storage kind of uh, mimicking the earlier cost curves for solar, where they, solar at one time was a very niche uh, sort of technology that only very wealthy people uh, put on their roof because they wanted to experiment or show their green credentials. And everyone thought, and this is going back to the late seventies and mid eighties, everyone thought, you know, it'll never be cost competitive. And now it's cheaper than, you know, lots of other competing technologies. So uh, same thing is gonna happen with, with storage. We're not quite there yet. And so because we're not quite there and because the markets aren't open to all the benefits and services storage can provide, and you can't monetize all of this, you have to be very careful about uh, figuring out how you can stack the, the services that are monetizable. And by stack, what I mean is uh, use the one storage resource that you're buying to provide different services that access different revenues and cost savings. So, and we do this all the time. This is not unique to storage. You do it with everything you own. You buy a car, it would be ludicrous to say, well, I'm just going to use this car to get groceries. That's all I'm going to do. And if I have to get to work, I'm gonna buy a second car for that. And if I have to the kids to the soccer, I'm gonna buy a third car for that. No, this is silly. You buy a car to provide all these different ranges of services that your family needs, that your neighborhood needs, that you need. And so we do the same thing with, with storage. We look for how we can stack different benefits and services uh, such that one resource can provide a number of different cost savings and revenue streams so that you can reach a payoff and a payback for your investment. And that's, that's basically what it is. There's nothing esoteric about it. Uh, the only reason that it's um, difficult sometimes is because, and this is something that uh, Massachusetts pointed out with the state of charge report a few years ago, which was a really landmark uh, effort to, to look into this, is that um, it's still very difficult to connect storage owners with the markets that they need to sell their services into. And FERC uh, order 2222 is starting to address that. Um, the, the previous FERC order also is addressing that uh, by, by telling the ISOs and RTOs that you need to open these markets, take down the barriers, level the playing field, and let uh, storage and other technologies provide these services if they can do so in a competitive way, and that's great. But we're not, we haven't reached that goal yet. So uh, if I buy a battery, I need to figure out what are the incentives, uh, are there pay for performance programs? Are there markets I can, uh, I can bid into? Are there aggregators that are gonna take my resource and aggregate it with a thousand other people's resources and sell that into a market? It's still not very straightforward, but we're getting there. Um, so, and I should say, uh, we have um, just published, a Clean Energy Group is, has just published two new reports I don't know if these were posted or sent out, but mm -hmm. they're on our website. They're free along with all our other resources. Uh, looking at the Connected Solutions Program in Massachusetts and how that uh, has started to allow uh, distributed storage to be funded and then aggregated into virtual power plants by utilities uh, and then uh, used to address grid needs and in a way that allows the storage owner to reach a payback uh, and, and to be paid for their performance. So that's a, that's a, a new thing uh, and just, just developed in the last couple of years in the Northeast and we think it has a lot of potential. Okay, can you give us some examples of where they're utilizing uh, incentives when it comes to um, storage? You mentioned Massachusetts. 
Sure. Uh, there are, well, the, so the Connected Solutions Program started in Massachusetts. It's now uh, up and running in Rhode Island and Connecticut, and there's been a pilot in New Hampshire. Uh, and that runs through the state energy efficiency program. Now, there's another very similar thing uh, that, um, and, and we were involved with, with helping to kind of support the development of both of these. The other, the other model is very similar, but runs through a utility demand response program. And we, we worked with Green Mountain Power on a pilot project here in Vermont uh, to, to help develop that. Uh, they're both similar. Pay for performance is the model. Uh, basically, the customer owns the storage in most cases, and the utility or the aggregator is, is paying for the service, uh, using it to provide grid needs or bid it into a market, and then paying the, 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 the owner of the storage for their uh, use of the resource. Uh, aside from that, though, there are many other types of incentives that we're seeing uh, being adopted at the state level. Uh, there are rebates, and we've been giving rebates to other technologies like solar for years. Now there are storage rebates in some states. Uh, there are solar programs that have a storage adder. So Massachusetts Smart Program, Rhode Island now has a, has a program where if you are installing solar and you are uh, qualified for solar rebate, and you also install storage, you have a storage adder um, to help you pay for that. Uh, there are financing schemes, low and no uh, cost financing through green banks, through state funds of various types. Um, and then there are the states that have the procurement requirements like California, where they tell the utility you're responsible, it's just like an RPS, but for storage, you're responsible for procuring X amount of storage by a certain date. Um, and in the case of California, they said some of this has to be at the, at the uh, bulk energy uh, you know, uh, on, the, on the transmission grid. Some of it has to be at the distribution level and some of it has to be at customer owned. And so they go out and they procure the storage uh, from these three different buckets um, to meet those requirements. Um, so there's all kinds of ways to do this. And again, mm -hmm. there's nothing new about any of most of this. The Connected Solutions Program is new, but most of this, we've done the same thing for wind. We've done the same thing for solar. Um, we've done the same thing for, you know, high efficiency boilers and furnaces and combined heat and power and all kinds of other things. So states can do this. It's just a matter of putting the policies in place. So Todd, I mean, I, I think that that makes so much sense. And I, I mean, I have the benefit of having read the recent report that you published, but you were, you started to talk about the idea of aggregating, um, and, and you've also talked a good bit about how storage is another form of, you know, sort of shifting load, right? So to get it at the right time. And one of the examples that I think a lot of folks in Minnesota are familiar with is the Great River Energy Water Heater Program. So I was hoping that you might be able to sort of describe how what the Connected Solutions Project is doing. And is that similar? Is it not so much? Like how, how might people compare those two examples in their mind, knowing that we have that thing sort of up and running already? Sure, so the water heater program, as I understand it would fall into a sort of a demand response model where basically you're saying, if you reduce your load behind the meter at certain times when demand is high in, in the, on the regional grid, and because the demand is high, prices are very high for electricity, so you reduce your load when the utility says, now's the time to do it. And they pay you something for doing that because it saves everybody money because peak demand is so very costly. Uh, Massachusetts in that state of charge report found that 40% uh, of the annual uh, uh, cost of electricity overall is attributable to the top 10% of peak demand hours in a year. So those peak hours are incredibly expensive and, and you, if you think about it, it's an efficiency issue. If you build an entire system, the grid and all the generators and all, all, all the parts of that system to meet occasional peaks, which you have to do to avoid blackouts, then the 95% you know, of the time when we're not having peak demand, you have idle uh, capacity on the system. So idle capacity on the system is, is just basically a, an efficiency problem. 
And so by flattening out the load cur demand curves, um, you increase efficiency and reduce the amount of overbuilding that you have to do. Um, the difference between the water heater program and what we're talking about with batteries, batteries don't just reduce load. Uh, so in the Connected Solutions program in Massachusetts, for example, you can get paid not only for reducing your load with a battery, but also for exporting additional power onto the grid from that battery. It has the same effect um, in sense that you are addressing those peak demand periods. The difference is that if you're just reducing load, then the benefit is limited to how much load you can reduce. You can't reduce load below zero, right? So if you stop charging your, if you stop charging your EV or you stop heating your water, you've stopped, that's all you can do. You can't negatively heat your water, right? right. If you stop uh, supplying your house from the grid because you're supplying your house from your battery instead, but then you've got more power in your battery and you can export that to the grid, then you have that added benefit. They found out in California that if you don't allow people to do that, it's a problem. Uh, there was a uh, heat storm event, I think it was in August uh, last year, and because of the regulatory structure, behind the meter resources are, were not allowed to export power. They were only allowed to reduce load. And so what happened was that uh, they had rolling blackouts. And so now they have an emergency regulatory uh, proposal to allow behind the meter resources to export power when called upon because it was just sitting there and they couldn't use it. So that's one big difference. Another big difference is that um, there's a difference between electricity storage and energy storage. So water heaters, you know, that's energy storage. You're storing heat, which is fine, but mm -hmm. uh, it's not the same as electricity storage. You can do more things with electricity storage. Okay. You're not going to make your house resilient by having a water heater. Todd, I want to do a time check because I want to make <laughs> sure we can get some. I know that you guys can talk about storage all day. Um, I want to make sure that we can get to some questions um, from our audience, but I want to get you all, all three of our, our panelists here, quick and dirty, quick and dirty. Like, um, what should we be thinking about for storage in Minnesota? Anybody? Policy. We need policy that supports it. That would be, you know, perhaps telling the utilities they need to procure a certain amount of storage and do it through competitive bidding. And because they just have to get more experience doing this and get used to it and yeah. try it out and see, and they might be surprised at the prices that they get, the bids they get, because that's been going on around the country. The bids are coming in often lower than anyone expects, especially when, they're, when you do hybrid resources like solar and batteries together. Mm -hmm. We also need policies that, you know, a lot of the things that um, Todd was talking about are, are a bit harder to do in a state like Minnesota. So on the East Coast, Northeast, most of the states are, um, are deregulated on their electricity markets. Their electricity prices are generally higher than ours. And so the cost effectiveness is a little different here in Minnesota to procure a storage device than it would be somewhere else where you're, you know, you're avoiding a higher cost than you would be here. And so we need incentives, we need pilot programs, which is what our um, community scale project was all about, trying to um, help, uh, you know, show what's possible in Minnesota and what the benefits can be and how uh, regular people should be able to access it. So those are some ideas. Um, the last thing I'll say is, in, we, you know, we're vertically integrated utilities um, systems here in the Midwest mo mostly. And that means that, you know, the utilities don't like aggregators. They don't like third parties coming in and buying and selling power with customers. So that's a barrier. That also is a policy challenge that we need to open up the market so that more innovation is possible and that storage can compete effectively with other kinds of technologies. Thanks, Ellen. Anybody? That was Anybody a good else want to? Mark or Todd, real quick. Sure. Um, I, Ellen, excellent points. Um, you know, I think an RPS, a statewide RPS would probably be a good way mm -hmm. to get storage in there. Um, in terms of what Minnesotans should think about energy storage, just think about what I'd like to leave you with is, is what is energy storage doing? You know, there's resiliency benefits and all sorts of other benefits that are contingent on the 
you know, the framework of the existing regulatory framework and the, peop the way people buy and sell electricity in the state. Um, but the bigger picture is when we, if we want to push the envelope to 100% renewables or very high levels of renewables, we need energy storage as a balancing tool. And in that context, I'd like everybody to think about the reframing of this curtailment and overbuilding concept, which we're terming implicit storage, because um, you might consider it waste, but the alternative is we're going to waste far more uh, on energy storage. Um, so we don't need as much, we need energy storage. We don't need as much as you might otherwise think. Thank you. And Tad, uh, yes. Can I know you're going to share a thought, but I want you to say yes. something about how we need to think about which populations get to adapt first. Um, right. There have been a bunch of questions in here about cost. There is a robust conversation happening mm -hmm. in the chat, which I just so appreciate. But I want to I want you to say something about like how how underserved communities, low income communities can participate as one yeah. thing to think about. Yeah, absolutely. That's where I was going to go anyway. So thank you. Um, the, yeah, I mean, in all of this, I mean, one of the one of the basic principles that that we have always uh, advocated for uh, Clean Energy Group is that is that energy storage should not follow the same kind of uh, uh, ad adoption curve as other clean energy technologies have done, which has been historically that. Uh, for early adopters tend to be wealthy uh, individuals and corporations who can afford to do this uh, new cool thing with the new cool technology. And then 20 years later, everybody else is still trying, scratching their heads, trying to figure out, you know, how to, how to join the party. Uh, the reality is that underserved communities and low-income uh, communities need energy storage the most. They need the resilience the most because they're hit hardest by natural disasters and the accompanying power outages. And they need the cost savings the most because they pay uh, a, a hugely more proportionate part of their income for energy than wealthier communities do. And, and energy is one of those things that, that after a point, it's rather inflexible and you, you can do all you can, you know, you, you can voluntarily cut back on lots of things, but you, you have to ha heat your house. You know, you have to have lights. You, you, there's certain things that you can't, beyond a certain point, um, you know, it's hard to reduce and, and conserve. And so um, the, the energy cost savings and the energy resilience are the, the, the two big um, sort of benefits of storage that are really needed in, in underserved communities. Um, and there are ways, policy ways, to make storage accessible to those communities. Uh, again, it's not rocket science. I and mean, we're talking about, um, you know, programs with adders, programs with carve outs for underserved communities, programs with uh, different kinds of financing supports. Uh, there are cost barriers to developing, uh, you know, developing new technologies in communities that that are that are not high income that where where financing is more expensive and so forth you can address those cost barriers okay mm -hmm. and you can do it very simply by making low cost financing and and rebates and other kinds of supports available it's extremely important uh, that we do this and the other thing that that will help a lot is a very is ensuring that the market, as it develops is a diverse competitive market. In other words, it's not owned by, utilities aren't the only ones that own storage, corporations aren't the only ones that own storage, um, certain you know, parts of the community aren't the only ones that own storage, uh, that, that there are, their storage exists in different scales and different areas of the geography and different areas of the community. Uh, that it's serving a diverse set of goals and, and needs and that it's able to access markets and that there's competition to bring prices down. So I think, I think that so, yeah, addresses your question. Point. Yes, it totally does. Thank you. Okay. So many good points. I will just say thank you all for all of these thoughtful questions. I, I mean, I think we hit on a lot of them. I know our panelists started responding. 
I suspect that there are many targeted questions that we can then continue to respond to. Let me tell you what's gonna happen. We recorded this, we'll be sending out the recording. We also have documented all of the things in chat and all of the Q&A, and we will work with our speakers to get some more answers. I know there were specific questions about cost and somebody else is saying on page 38 of this, and we will work to get more answers out to all of you. We'll be putting out a blog, and this really will inform the next session, which is gonna be focused on more of those on the ground, tangible, you know, like what can we do on a home? What can we do at that community scale? We're gonna dig into that more. So thank you all for your robust engagement and to our speakers, y'all, thank, thank you. you. Um, I can tell that there are a lot of people who would be happy to pick your brain for a few hours. Mm -hmm. um, this was just, just great. We'll be sending out a survey. So we would love your responses. And Akisha, you have an announcement about quick, a guide. Quick, quick. Yeah. Quick plug, uh, the Institute on the Environment is releasing its energy storage guidebook in March. And so look forward to that tool that can be helpful for uh, community scale storage projects. And thank you all for joining us. Have a good evening. Thanks everybody. Have a good afternoon. Bye-bye.